All right. And we're back for part two of two. It was dumb to do it the first time, and now it's really dumb to do it again. But I figure some people weren't around, you know, earlier this morning, might be on this afternoon. And so, and I'm doing a little bit different this time. Uh, this is something I, I was kind of inspired to do this by my, my buddy and art director for White Rocket, Jared does the, um, uh, Jared Albrecht does the, um, his little pop-up live watching him draw things. And, you know, obviously watching somebody draw is far more interesting and exciting uh, and magical than watching somebody write. And I understand that it's something that I, you know, I, as a writer I've lived with my whole life is the idea that an artist can draw something and hold it up and go, huh, huh, huh. And people go, boom, I get the whole thing. I get it. I give you feedback. Uh, instantaneous, right? Just as long as it takes them the length of time, it takes them to look and react. And there it is. Whereas a writer can spend years hammering away <laughs> at a book and go, huh, huh, huh? And you're asking for the the, uh, the person to spend a lot more time before they can react, you know? In other words, artists, artists can get instant feedback and writers require a much bigger investment on the part of the audience to get complete feedback. Now that's not to say that the, that the person looking at the art um, appreciates everything that went into the art. No, certainly not. But they can get a general sense of what's there and if they like it or not just by looking, whereas you can't just look at a novel and go, woo, 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 and, and know, you know, everything that's in it. You have to work your way through it, and it takes a long time. So uh, it's just not quite as... Um, Yes, I have enormous envy and jealousy of artists. I've always said there's a sorcery, right, to art. And whatever magic there might be in writing is something that is, um, it's, it's more opaque, right? It's not as visible to the audience. You have to read something and then absorb it to appreciate it. But that being said, that being said, here we are. Um, I'm going to do the best I can. Like I said, I, you can go back and see the 30 minutes that I did earlier where I, I actually worked on the first few paragraphs. Oh, yes, Rob, it absolutely is. There's no question about it. I have enormous unbridled respect and envy for artists. Absolutely. I, you know, I spent my entire childhood and early adulthood trying to be an artist. I went, I took art classes at Auburn university and I took enough to learn that I could be workmanlike at it if I wanted to devote all my time to it. But that's not where my natural talent lay. And I realized that. And so I bailed, except for occasional little fun things, and went to where I thought that I had much more natural ability uh, and more interest in, in working at it, which is writing. Okay, And that's what I've done ever since. And I feel like I've done it pretty darn successfully. Um, but is it magic? That's up to the, that's in the, that's up to the, to the audience to determine. But um, anyway, so what I want to do now in the first, in the, in the one this morning, uh, in the 30 minutes this morning, I actually from a blank page created the beginning of a new book. And it's um, for those that, that watched it and were wondering where I was going with it. I was not even saying I was going to let you try to figure it out. Um, it, it started with a young man waking up in a, in a strange room and an alarm was going off and he woke up and he didn't know what was going on. And he flails out with his arm to try to find the alarm clock and there's nothing there. There's no table. There's no alarm clock. He couldn't figure it out. He sits up, he looks over, there's another little bed next to him. It's like, he's in a little, like a little hotel room, little place facility. There's another little bed with another young guy lying on it. Who's waking up. And when they both sit up, the alarm stops. And we left it there for a second and I skipped ahead and they walked out into an area where there was like, it was like a, like a, um, a lounge, a restaurant area where people are all sitting around talking, having drinks. They emerge out into this. There'll be an, I haven't written it yet. There'll be an extended scene where they sort of talk to these people, get to know them, figure out what's going on here. 
And then we determined that there was another signal that they had to go to their vehicles. And they're all people are all exiting and running out into the parking lot. And there's all sorts of vehicles parked there. And they look at them and I'm going to describe some of the vehicles, but people are already jumping in them and taking off down the highway. And the one that they end up getting in is a red Ferrari. And everybody else is in a hurry, jumping in these other vehicles and taking off. And so my question to you is, can anybody figure out? I mean, I said that the, the approach I'm going to take with that book, with that story, is a kind of a Stephen King one. Not in terms of the story or the character so much as just the approach of the prose, the way I'm writing it, where it's kind of like you're getting to know these characters in great detail early on as you figure out what's going on and why around them. OK, that's my goal with this book. You know, and that is one writing thing I can talk about real quick right here is that um, I concern myself as much. And again, I'm, I'm just talking for me. I'm sure everybody has different ways of doing it, but I'm just talking for me. I concern myself as much with the approach to a particular story or book, the way I'm going to do it as much as what it's about and who it's about. Right. I mean, that's two completely different sets of, uh, of criteria, sets of, of things to determine. There's, there's what is the plot? Who are the characters? What is all going on here? But there's also the style, the approach, how I'm going to go about telling the story, how I want to reveal things, how do I want to create mysteries? That's a big part of it, too. And there's lots of different ways you can do that. It can be, it can be, it can involve whether you do first. I, I talked before, it can involve whether you do first person or third person. It can involve whether you're emulating like the style of, of Edgar Allan Poe, maybe, or Stephen King, or Roger Zelazny, as I've done before to a certain degree, or a Larry Niven, or a, you know, there's a lot of different approaches and styles uh, that you can that you can use. Um, I, I generally tend to use kind of a neo pulp style, um, which you would find in places like the Black Library, Warhammer, Warhammer 40,000 type approach. Uh, you find it in a lot of my contemporaries in writers that 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 kind of write the same general way that I do in this new pulp movement that we have. Um, but um I'm not going to name any of them because then I'd have to name 50 and I don't want to leave anybody out. So I won't, I'll, I'll leave everybody out, but you know them. They're my Facebook friends and my Twitter friends and, and uh, published by some of the same companies and all that. Um, but we all have, uh, you know, different ways of going about it, but we all are kind of, kind of using that pulp approach. And I'm wanting, and so for this particular, for that particular story I was just describing that I was doing earlier, um, it's that sort of a Stephen King approach that, 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 so that it's, there's you're wondering why are there cars there where who are these young guys why are they running around but also you know the way that i'm laying it out for you in kind of a slow burn detail which is a way that that, that king would probably do it um so um i'm i'm curious if anybody kind of has a sense of where that's going I, re I realize i haven't told you enough how about if i tell you this much they I, and i had to think about it and i may change this yet but i had them both jump in a red Ferrari boxer. But other vehicles that were in that parking lot that I did not have a chance to mention included a race car and a van, perhaps an ambulance. And I did have two of the characters We can, uh, let me switch over to the screen share. I got to get out of the one I'm working on now. Uh-oh. Um, but I did have, uh, of the, I uh, made some more notes there. I did have two of the characters were female. Hmm. And would it do anything for you to, for me to tell you that one of the vehicles in that parking lot was a black Lamborghini. Does that do anything for you? We got a red Ferrari. We got a black Lamborghini. We got a van. We got a race car. Maybe an ambulance. Hmm. 
but yet it's more of a Stephen King type story. There's a mystery and there's coercion. There's coercion in this. So I'm going to give it just a minute for comments to catch up and see if anybody that's watching, if there's anybody uh, to, to quote the great Def Leppard and Joe Elliott, is anybody out there? Nah, nah, nah. Anyone at all? Nah, nah, nah. Didn't know I was going to be singing. Okay, uh, Paulo Costa. Hey, Paulo. Lamborghini should be yellow. You just established the Lambo owner has no taste. Good. <laughs> yes, I. Oh, oh, well, the only ones I've ever seen in person were red, honestly. But the one I'm referring to very specifically right now is a black Lamborghini. And where have we ever seen a black Lamborghini in popular culture? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, but um, I, I know a page. Um, should I give it away? Should I tell you what the big deal is it's not the plot or the story or the ending or anything like that but just what it is you know i mentioned in the previous show a little this morning that i like to take different things and kind of merge them together and blend them together and create something kind of new out of it well among the influences on this one this is going to be sort of a ready player one because i've been wanting to do my own version of that for a while kind of a ready player one the long walk by stephen king and the cannonball run i'm writing a cannonball run novel as told by Stephen King and Ernest Cline. Go figure that one, huh? I said too much. I said too much. Well, in our remaining time, I thought I would work on an existing novel a little bit and show you what that one's like. And, uh, oh, I have to, I'll go all the way back to the beginning. Shoot. Let me find where we are. Hold on here. You can look at me looking at this. You don't need to see all this. That would be bad. So I have to find it. I, I closed it out to show you that. And I shouldn't have because I lost the place that I was at in this one. But what I want to show you is here it is. Good. Okay. Okay. So, um, you may not be able to see that very well. I can blow it up in just a second. Um, I'm working on Miami heist and I thought you might like to see this little, this is just a flashback chapter. So it doesn't spoil anything at all for the, uh, other than what one character is up to, but I'm working on uh, the next chapter I'm going to work on is a flashback chapter. Because basically the way that Miami Vice, uh, Miami Vice, I keep saying that, Miami Heist, it rhymes with it. The way that Miami Heist is structured is it starts out with Harper and Salsa and Lois. Remember them from Vegas. It starts out with them discovering something that they're not very happy about and beginning to case the joint in terms of their next big operation, right? If there's obviously going to be a Miami heist or the book wouldn't be called Miami heist. So Miami heist is going to begin with them getting ready to uh, do the Miami operation. And then it's going to carry through how they gather their, their team this time around. I don't think it gives anything away because this is just standard for this kind of a story, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to tell how they gather their team together, how they um, put, it, put the plan into operate. Well, they gather the team together. They get the things that they need. 
and they put the plan into operation. But what happens is as they are rendezvousing to get started on the operation, the actual robbery, the heist, uh, one of them is missing. Something has happened to one of our intrepid threesome from Vegas. And they're not sure what to make of that, but it's kind of too late to stop now. So they, they're going to go ahead and go through with the operation. And if, as of course it goes along, things begin to happen that are not supposed to happen because that's the way heists work, right? Is that things start happening bad and you have to deal with them on the fly. And then, um, and then we get right up to the point. And this is the part I'm very excited about with this book. There's a couple of things about this book I'm very excited about. And I can't wait for people to see. And that is um, you get right up to the point where they're pulling off the heist and then there's a shocking, I hope, a shocking revelation, a shocking twist. And we get right to the end of that chapter in that moment where there's this shocking reveal. And then, and this is kind of the way Westlake would do it in the in his, his Richard Stark and the Parker novels, but not exactly the same way because he had a very set structure. He would do part one, part two, part three, part four, whereas usually part two or part three was the flashback flashback section. Okay. I'm kind of mixing mine in more, but I do want to have kind of a flashback deal. I didn't really do that so much. I don't think I didn't really do that in Vegas heist. Vegas heist was very linear. You had a couple of flashbacks to when the, uh, the construction foreman guy was alive, but generally Vegas heist was pretty linear from A to Z from beginning to end. But this one, we're going to get right up to the big critical moment. And see, now that we've revealed certain characters and certain events, then we can flash back and show how that came to be, right? Sometimes doing it as a flashback that way helps because it preserves the mystery, right? In other words, if I told this story in a linear fashion, you would know who the villain was and that takes away some of the fun. But if we start kind of in the middle and go up to the climax and then you see the villain appear, you get that big shock. Whoa. Then we go back and flash back and fill in the beginning and you see how that villain came to be there. And eventually the flashback chapters catch up to the present time and we fold them back together again and we go into the climax and the resolution. See, that's, that's how it's, that's going to be structured. So, so for this chapter, I can say one character you have seen before, if you read Vegas heist was Ricky Garcia. He was one of the police officers uh, who <laughs> there's that scene. When I say there's a uh, that great scene, I, what I mean by that is I wrote it, but I'm really proud of it. Right. So I think it's a great scene where Garcia and I believe his partner was black. That was his name. Uh, the, you know, officer Garcia and officer black. I believe they were, uh, they were patrolling around this area of Vegas when things start happening at the at Caesar's Palace. Try not to spoil Vegas Heist if you haven't read it, but run right out and get it. Uh, there's by the way, if you want to hear Vegas Heist on audio, uh, Pete Milan did a fabulous job of performing all the different characters doing the audio book on Audible, and um, if you go to uh, audiobooksunleashed.com you can, there's still free codes available. You can pick up a free copy of Vegas heist on audible and I get paid for it. So it's win, win you get it for free and I get paid. Can't go wrong there. Right. So anyway, it was a uh, one Pulp factory award, best novel of the year last year. So, so you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. But anyway, so um, there's this scene I really like where Garcia and black officers, police officers, are out patrolling and they're noticing something kind of weird going on in, in Vegas at night. And all of a sudden there's kind of an explosion sound and the man <laughs> and the manhole cover opens up and some people come out. Huh? So ever since that moment, detective Garcia, <laughs> these are different guys. Yeah. Kevin's exactly right because I, I named uh, one of the security guards in the in the hotel after Kevin and one after Jim Yelton, good, both good buddies, but and good sports about it. Um, 
But yeah, the, the two security guards had a bad time. These two police officers have a bad time too. And so Detective Garcia, we will see, has actually become private Detective Garcia now, and he is on the case. So if we go over here now, let's just show you just a couple of minutes of what I'm working on here in this flashback. We have Detective Garcia actually watching the house in Flagler Beach. This would be Harper's house. Um, Harper famously has a house in Flagler Beach, Florida, which is north of Daytona, south of Jacksonville, I believe. I've been there. That's why I was able to use it. I spent some time there a couple of years ago and enjoyed it very much. It's a very much of a small town uh, anomaly in the middle of built up corporate Florida coast, you know, and so um, it was very neat, very neat deal. And I thought it was a really cool town. I thought it'd be a great place that Harper would want to live where he could stay out of the hubbub of the big city, you know, when he didn't want to be down in Miami, even though it's 1965 and now we're in 1966. This book takes place in 1966. Um, so we've advanced a few months from where the previous one ended. Um, so again, just to kind of do some quick, uh, work on it, give you a sense of, um, let me see if it's still paragraph. Yeah. Okay, good. So in the previous chapter, um, he found out where that house was using his detective skills and, um, Oh, I got to tell you one other thing that's kind of funny real quick. I'm proud of. Uh, I just rewrote it last night. So I'm actually working on Miami Heist again now. Thank goodness. But I rewrote this chapter. There's actually a chapter where Salsa uh, goes into a um, Salsa goes into a uh, the, the Dade County planning office to get some maps and has an interesting exchange with the young man behind the counter and with a little old lady who's looking up something in one of the books off to the side. And uh, I think you'll enjoy that too. It's kind of an extended scene and it's one of those that doesn't have to be there except that it gives you a little bit of flavor of uh, what Salsa's up to and how he cons people and how he gets what he wants and how he bamboozles a naive young man with his wit and his charm and his fast talking ways from, from Las Vegas down there in South Florida in the sixties. So I think you'll get a kick out of that. I very much enjoyed writing it. And I, I went back and rewrote it twice because I think it's very important that all the notes in a scene like that sound right. You know, in other words, if you're watching a movie and a character says something that doesn't seem right, it jumps out at you. And I feel the same way about a book. You know, I read very carefully slowly and carefully when I read. And if, and if dialogue or way a scene plays out, doesn't seem right, it's going to jump out at me. So I went back and rewrote that a couple of times to make sure it really sounded good. So I guess for here, I'll just go ahead and, and insert right here and, and, and give you a sense of how I'm going to do it. So, you know, with when I, the beginning of a chapter, the beginning of a story is always a an interesting time for me. I don't ever let it be a negative. Never, never, never say, Oh no. Oh no. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? It's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity. It's a pitch over the plate and it's up to you. How hard you're going to swing and you going to, are you going to bun it? Are you going to hit it hard? You're going to try for a grand slam. Um, Oh, Kevin has a nice comment here. Can't wait to read this one. I love, well, I appreciate that so much, Kevin. And I'm going to do my best. One of the reasons this book is taking so long is I didn't want to just crank out crap. And, and rely on people wanting to get it because they like the first one. The the last thing I want is people to get Miami heist and go, oh, this one wasn't nearly as good as the first one, right? That's the fear is I want people to go, oh, another, another good one. Or maybe it's almost as good. It's going to be hard to be as good as that first one, at least in terms of how I how it came together for me. I've said it's lightning in a bottle. It came together just the way I wanted it to. It's going to be hard for that to replicate that success. I'm having to replicate that lightning in a bottle this time with just hard work, but I'm hoping with enough hard work, I can fashion something that's as good as the first one. So, um, so this is the opportunity that you have to, um, to really go for something here. And, and I always like, you know, I feel like I've got a quiver of arrows full of chapter beginnings approaches. And I like to think about it and go, you know, how can I, how would, what would work here? How do I want to say it? 
um, you know, with the with the with the race story I mentioned earlier, I opened it with the alarm blaring and the guy waking up and trying to grab it. I thought that's a good way to grab your attention. Uh, for this one, you know, this is more like surveillance. This is more uh, Ocean's Eleven type stuff, and so it doesn't have to be big action. It can be slow burn intrigue if you want to that way. So I would just say something like, um, let me start this way. I can say uh, when. Harper exited his house in Flagler Beach and climbed into the seat of his shiny new 1966 Camaro. And by the way, you know, I like to make lots of references. I do a lot of research on these two books and I like to know what's going on at the time and what I can throw in. And the Camaro was brand new in 1966. This is the first year of the Camaro. I figure, well, if Harper got that money in Vegas uh, or did he, whoops, uh, if Harper came out of Vegas with some money, um, he's going to buy a nice car. He's going to buy a brand new Camaro to go along with his old, you know, nondescript blue uh what did he have in the previous like a lincoln maybe a lincoln something like that a big big land whale car uh so when harper gags his house in flagler beach and climbed in the sea of his shiny 1966 uh 1966 camaro i didn't say blue but i don't think blue fits in there very well right now i'll come to that later um comma he was being watched A short distance down the narrow street. And again, I'll perk all this up in the rewrites. I'm just trying to show you how I do it. A short distance down the, down the narrow street sat a battered early 60s sedan. And I can come up with whatever car it is. Um, dirt colored and rusting behind the wheel sat a battered <laughs> trench coat wearing guy with a dark fedora pulled low over his face or however i can again refine that all that was visible of him was his right hand which held a pair of binoculars aimed directly at Harper. Okay. So we know that Harper's being watched. And then I got a couple of notes here that it's Garcia. He's watching the house. Harper's getting in that car and driving away. And then as I say, Garcia is going to break in. Uh, and, and so where I'm going to get on, you know, I'm going to walk through the whole process. If he drives away, Garcia goes in, I'll describe him breaking in the door. And I'm sure that Harper being Harper, he set certain traps and everything. And Garcia will either get around some of them or get hit by some of them and be bruised and bloody or whatever. But Garcia will make his way down to where a uh, certain thing is stashed. And as Garcia finds it and pulls it out, bam, something hits him over the head and the world goes black. All right. So that was uh, 29 minutes and a few seconds. Uh, just again, another idea of how, how we go about doing this. I'm sure everybody does it differently. Um, once I get things like that going, I'll just sit down and let it go and it'll go faster and faster. And when I really know what's going on, I was just kind of making it up as I went along. But when I really kind of, this is why I like to outline, right? When I really have a good outline, and I know what's going on, know what I'm doing then I can just go fast. I can go, 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 go. The only thing I'm having to think of then is um, details. What color a car, 
who does he see? Who does he talk to? So, all right. Well, my time is up. I thank you for yours. I hope you enjoyed it. And maybe I'll do another one of these, one of these days when I come up with another approach. Uh, but um, leave me some comments either on Twitter, reply back or on Facebook. Leave me some comments and tell me what would you like to see me talk about and do in this kind of thing if I do another one in the future? Like what kind of what processes that I haven't done so far? Because I've mostly looked at beginnings today. So we can dig into one that's a part that's already written in the future and um, we can look at how to do it, uh, you know, do the, the middle part, the later part. In fact, let's see, David has a question right here. How close are your first drafts, your finished story? How heavily are they generally revised? You know, there's never, there's not one answer for that, David. It's a great question, but the fact is it totally depends. Um, I've written entire books that I had to make maybe 15 changes to the first draft from beginning to end. And I've written books that I've done multiple drafts of the entire manuscript over and over. Uh, I've done books where, um, where I've uh, taken the entire manuscript and busted it open and added like another 50,000 words to it uh, in, you know, here and there and all and fleshed it out even more. Uh, so it really varies. It varies from book to book, from, from time to time and place to place. Um, Vegas heist, man, that came together in two, you know, in two or three weeks. And then I sent it out to a few people that read it and gave me suggestions and I incorporated their suggestions and changed things. I think I went back and added maybe one or two more chapters at the very end of the process. Just, I felt like it needed a little more information. I think there was a chapter where I kind of explained the villain's motivations better. And I think there was a chapter I added that kind of let us see Harper in action to get us a better sense of who he was. Um, but other than that, um, other than that, oh, and David also says, how about a look at character creation? That's a good one. Yeah, I, um, if there's one thing I really enjoy doing, it's coming up with characters and finding names for them that are apt. I'm really big. I spend a, I, I probably spend more time figuring out the names of my characters than I do writing whole pages of their actions because I want the name to be perfect. I want the name to be absolutely fitting. I think that probably the best job I've ever done with that, with character names and descriptions would be in like the Lucian and Baranak and Caroline books where I think that I'm, I'm very happy with those names. I think also the um, Cold Lightning, both the novella and the comic book. I think uh, I'm, re I'm really happy with how those characters came out. I wanted to have a team and so in cold light, I'm going a little bit over here because these are good questions. I want to address them and there's no losses. I have to stop any particular time. But um, in cold lightning, I wanted a team, right? I wanted kind of an infiltration team, like a commando unit. And so I wanted like a commander guy, the guy that's in charge, kind of the Cyclops, the Captain America, you know. Um, I wanted a, um, a big muscle guy, right? I wanted a stealth guy that works in the shadows. Uh, I for sure wanted one character to be female, at least, if not more. And I liked, I liked the idea that the female, that the main female character would be a um, kind of a priestess, a religious figure, but she's been trained to be like a warrior priestess. So she's, and that, you know, the idea that one of your characters is very religious uh, automatically begs the question, well, then one of the others is going to be kidding them about that, right? So the big muscle guy is going to be kidding the religious lady and she's going to be snapping back at him. Instantly, you've got some chemistry, right? As soon as you start figuring out who these people are, their relationships start taking shape and you, and you get real chemistry emerging. And that's what you want. You want your chemistry to not be forced. You want it to organically evolve from those characters. And I feel like if I do a good job of creating the characters up front, and if I name them in such a way that their names are evocative and memorable, uh, that you know exactly who I'm talking about when I mention their names. And of course, in the comics, you don't have to worry as much about that. You have visuals, but in the, in the, in the book, in the novella, you know, it's important then um, because it's the only cues you have, then um, that goes a long way toward the readers um, feeling like it's natural, feeling like this is, this is how this scene would happen. This is the relationship these characters would have with each other. This is how they would speak to each other. Even though I've just met them, I've just encountered them. 
they seem real. So that's a big, um, that's a big thing. Hey, Auburn Tiger Talk, what up with you too, man? That's great. I appreciate everybody being on board. Um, okay. So yeah, we'll, I'll mark down that I'll do one in the future on just on characters. And we'll talk about maybe how I came up with some in the past and, and, uh, where we're going in the future with that. So, all right, I'm going to get on out of here for now and go have some late lunch. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, this is basically what my students are having to put up with this last this, this month too, last month and this month. So we'll see you guys later and uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, adios. <laughs>